everybody. Good evening. My name is Robert Ayon, president of the Guayaquil Space Society. It's great to have your presence today. And uh, we're very excited about this very special event where we're going to be talking about medical applications and how they relate for crewed missions to space. And we have some great speakers today, and I will introduce them briefly. I'll just want to give you a quick update about the Guayaquil Space Society. And this event is in collaboration with the Centro Cuatriano North Americano, the English but, uh, Bilingual Institute. And welcome. This is Guayaquil, and we definitely want to welcome you. Things have changed uh, with uh, COVID now with vaccination, so we'll be glad to have you visit us soon. So right now, we are having some exciting activities happening around the world where access to space is really something that is becoming more and more accessible. Even though it might not be affordable yet to some people, at least we see an interest and that interest can drive demand and for this, these services to become something that eventually on the road will become more accessible. We have an upcoming mission now with uh, the company Blue Origin that is owned by Jeff Bezos. And he's planning his own trip to space with his brother. Then we have Elon Musk with one mission that is going uh, with a Japanese billionaire around the moon in the next couple of years with his new rocket. And then there's another mission called Inspiration4 that has four non-NASA astronauts. These are commercial participants. They're going to be leading an amazing mission to fundraise for San Jude Hospital. And one of our previous speakers, Dr. Sian Proctor, is going to be taking place there. And we were very happy to have her a couple months ago in one of our activities here. And uh, now she's going to be able to achieve her dream of going to space. So that's, that's wonderful news. And then we also have Virgin Galactic, whom we hear that Richard Branson wants to go to space too. So maybe in July, we might be seeing Jeff Bezos and uh, Richard Branson going to space. So who knows? Let's see how that goes. But let me just quickly introduce our first speaker. We're very excited that he's with us today. We, we know him for a very, very, very long time. His name is Dr. Jeronimo Casanello. Uh, he's a specialist in internal medicine, critical medicine, uh, intensive therapy, and, uh, and he works at the Hospital Luis Vernaza here in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And he's uh, a professor at the U.S. and University of Guayaquil, and he's a member of the consultative community. And he'll, he also has uh, a master's degree in uh, hospital, ma hospital management from Espai Espo University. So let me welcome Jeronimo. Jeronimo, we're very happy that you're with us. Please, thank you, join us. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I am very happy to be with you. We are going to talk about some medical aspects of this space adventure. So let's start. Uh, wait. OK. Right now, maybe this is one of the youngest uh, specialties in medicine, space medicines. You know, we have to support and make the protection of the human life uh, in the space. And the space medicines uh, do the practice of all aspects of preventive medicine, including screening, healthcare delivery, and maintaining human performance in the extreme environment of a space and preserving the long-term health of safe travelers. Uh, we have, uh, all the people who do that uh, have experience with the professional astronaut, but in a near future, we have maybe to, to take care of the passengers in the special tourism. So maybe we are going to, to start a, 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 a big journey around the globe, you know, in the space. Well, there are, Sometimes types of space flights, uh, they are the suborbital that are very short. They involve exposure to increased acceleration in the vertical and horizontal planes. This happen over the 100 kilometers uh, over the level C. 
and you are going to spend only hours in that uh, in that place and maybe use a few minutes of uh, under over uh, or with with a condition environment with a low gravity we're going to talk about it these are going the first step for the special tourism the second are the low earth orbit in vehicles in orbit around the earth at an altitude of two and four hundred kilometers uh, here are the part of the most experience that we have in the space conditional and the third class are the exploration class missions that are expeditions to the moons mars and other celestial objects and locations near the earth such as asteroids and space stations no maybe they are in the in some years from here no but in any moment we can work with those patients from mars you know or maybe a call I, I don't know but to be a professional astronaut you have to to meet some medical standards you have to be a, a good clinical and health conditions a fitness and you need to know that even there even they have or shouldn't have conditions that may cause incapacitation in the space for example a coronary artery disease um, renal kidney stones, epilepsy, or some conditions that may interact with the space environment of life support systems. For example, the pressure that can affect your lungs if you have emphysema or COPD or asthma. And also, they shouldn't have conditions that are incompatible with a long duration deep space mission. What's happening is you have a chronic health condition uh, for example, uh, blood hypertension, diabetes, but you are going to use a lot of drugs uh, because you are going to spend a lot of time in the space. Maybe you cannot go to the space, of course. But what happened in those uh, people exposed to suborbital, for example, of these uh, travels to a to an asteroid, if we can do it. They are going to be affected first with microgravity. There are the near weightlessness environment that arise as a consequence of a free fall motion of the vehicle as it orbits Earth or travels through the space on a ballistic trajectory. The microgravity is going to be uh, present in the first days in the space. Yes, there is the space adaptation syndrome within the first three days with headache, vomit, pallor, and nausea. This affects the, maybe the 60 and the 80 of all the astronauts and is going to happen in the people who goes to the space in tourism. So this is a, a condition that we have to be prepared. But we have to know that the microgravity is going to to, to cause some physiological changes in our bodies. It's going to affect, for example, the touch and pressure sensor that are going to register no downward forces, that auto leads in the inner ear respond different, differently to motion, and this is going to change sensory input, confuses our brain, and causing occasional disorientations. Also, you are going to have an increase in kidney filtration rate that also is going to affect your bone. You are going to lose bone and cause these kidney stones. Your legs are going to have fluid retention. You have to be redistribution of these fluids and you're going to put your fluids in your body in the, in the central part. Leave, leading to a, the famous uh, called chicken legs. You are going to have fluid redistribution that causes head congestion and puffy face. Also, you lost blood plasma, creates temporary anemia or return to the earth. Have to weight bearing bones and muscle deterioration. For that uh, point, it's very important that the people in the space make exercises or to, to conserve the muscle mass 
and this oil is going to be affected with the microgravity. That is the principal part. The second part is the radiation effect, but the radiation is going to affect the people who are going to spend a lot of time in the space, maybe weeks, months, and all and years. No, there are some types of radiations, the galactic cosmic radiations, the solar particle events, solar protons, trap radiation. All of them are going to damage a cellular DNA, impeding response to cytokines and increase the risk of certain cancers. You all are going to have uh, effects in all your body if you spend a lot of time there. First, we are going to talk about the musculoskeletal skeletal systems. You are going to have bone demineralization with increased excretion of calcium. That causes a loss of bone, one or maybe 1.6% per month in your spine, femur, neck, trochanter, and pelvis. These are the, the principal parts that are going to be affected. Maybe drugs like bisphosphonate, exercise, and diet are used to fight these bad defects or deleterious defects. The neurological system is, going, is also going to be affected. You are going to have impairment in the neurovestibular system and loss some of your coordination. You are going to have degradation in visual acuity, causing the speed flight associated neuroocular syndrome. A lot of astronauts, maybe 40% of them, are going to have this problem when they came back to the Earth with optic disc edema, globe flattering, choroidal folds, and cotton wool spots. You also are going to have a sleep disruption, alteration in light and dark cycles, the illumination of the environment where you are going to be, the quick workload are going to affect your sleep. The regulation of the moon system is going to be an increase in granulocytes and results and decrease in lymphocytes and natural killer cells. This is going to prone you to infections. It's very very difficult part because if you are going to spend a lot of time in the space, maybe you don't have the drugs to combat, to, to fight the, that infection, no? Renal kidney stones, because you have hypercalciuria, this is calcium in your urine, you decrease your urine output and change in the concentration of this. And also it's going to be present space anemia. A lot of risks you have when you have to retry and landing and post flight. For example, depressurizations, crash, fire, trauma of a normal landing, or maybe if you landing in, in, I don't know, in the sea or in the desert, for example, you're going to have post landing survival problems. Occupational health hazards, like water treated with trialkalamines to reduce iodine, exposure to hydrocytes that are in the rocket fuels, you have to consider that. It's very rare, but it's something that can happen. Extravehicular activity, you, of course, that is more for, for astronauts, but if you make some space walk, you have thermal stress, micrometeroids, radiation hazards, and heart vacuum. Also, you can present the compression sickness, nitrogen gas and reduced ambient pressure can produce you joint pain, confusion, motor in coordination and loss of con consciousness. We need to be prepared for that. So we make medical planning. You need in the space medication that should be chemically stable and thermally robust and have a well shelf for life. You need sometimes health tool for health to the diagnosis of these conditions or sickness. And you cannot have a rack uh, x-ray machine or a CT scan or a MRI, but you can have an ultrasound. This is very useful in war, in, in ships, for example, and for us in the bedside day-to-day uh, -day, uh, treating of patients, no? the ultrasound. And communication, because this is, this is also a problem. For example, if you need telemedical support, the communication can be very difficult. From Mars to the Earth, it may be 
came very late the, the communication, maybe around an hour, and it's going maybe to be a problem if you have a really an emergency situation there. Well, they have the medical conditions that we know that can happen in the space. They are very common. We have medicine for that. We don't have really a, a real problem with, with those here. Space motion sickness, NAS and sinus congestion, constipation, headache, back pain, for example. These are maybe more problematic. For example, renal stone and renal tract infection, gastroenteritis. Uh, and the, the, the third column is, real, is really a, a problem, no? It's a challenge situation. If you have uh, appendicitis, for example, or diverticulitis, or maybe sepsis, that is a, a very difficult infection in your body, it's going to be a, a real problem if you spend a lot of time there. The last part are the shock cardiogenic malignancy or head injury or a lumbar spine fracture, for example. They are not addresses at the space right now because are very very severe condition, conditions we don't have the drugs we don't have the technology in the space to treat them so it's going to be a, our problem maybe we don't have a solution if that happens in the space that's uh, that's the, the reality okay like doctors we have to uh, take account the clinical part, the human performance and the human system engineering. So we work in there. In the clinical part, we make the selection. The, the person has to meet the standards. We have testing to do it. We have psychological screening. It is very important. Uh, we have to make a training and pre-flight, for example, health promotion, travel health, fitness to fly. And sometimes like the COVID right now, even the quarantine, for example. The launch and landing, you have to make, make an emergency cover, for example, and public health is they came, for example, with a infectious disease. The human performance, they need to, to study the effects on and change in physiology and performance and variability. Uh, we have to take care of the altitude, reduce pressure, the acceleration, the G-forces, microgravity and radiation that I talk about it, noise and thermal uh, risks, the sleep, fatigue and circadian circle, all of this we have problem in, in this person, the nutrition. Human system and engineering, personal protective equipment like clothing, space suits, personal emergency systems, vehicles and habitats are also important, the environment they are going to live, life support systems, living and live space, solid team, food, water, and medical device that they can keep with them. In flight, the routine medical care and telemedical support is very important, psychological support also, emergency manage management, evacuation advice, if happening an accident, acute care, major incident medical management systems, extreme environment medicine and survival, post-flight, also, the physical rehabilitation and psychological support. We have also the human and error contribution to incident and accident. We need to uh, make an investigation if that happened. We also have to, to be very, very hard to work a lot in training, education, and simulation to be prepared for whatever situation that can occur in the space, performance, optimization, and enhancement. And also, we have to consider human factors, anthropometry, ergonomics, escape systems, impact protection, and survival aids. It's really a, a, big, a big task to take with these people, and we are to prepare. Maybe no, it's not so easy to say, I'm going to the space, and, and OK, I'm going to travel. We maybe are going to be a, a really prepared. No? OK, well, thank you. Uh, we are going to talk later. and. We're going to continue with our next uh, expositor. Dr. Casanelos, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. We're very glad that you joined us. And today we want to thank again Hotel Oro Verde for being the host of the event where we're transmitting live right now. Thank you so much. Amalia Freire, who is a, a great participant from uh, Hotel Oro Verde, who has been very supportive of our efforts for, for the transmission. Thank you. And. Uh, now, I would like to introduce Dr. Mechora Duñana, 
which we are delighted to have as a guest. We are honored. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Let me tell you a little bit about him because he's something very special who has no fears and no limits, I think. He's a pilot, he climbs mountains, he scuba dives, he goes everywhere. And he was born in Mexico. He graduated from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. He special with a specialty in aerospace medicine in Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And he completed his fellowship of postdoctoral in the National Academy of Science in the School of Aerospace Medicine in the Air Force in San Antonio, Texas. And currently he's the director of the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, CAMI, from the FAA, Florida, the Federal Aviation Association in Oklahoma City. And he's also a member of the International Academy of Astronautics. And his list of accomplishment is immense. A lot of publications, a lot of uh, interviews and presentations. He's amazing. He has a great heart. We've been, we're glad to call him a, a friend from Ecuador. And he has a lot of experience with uh, projects and doctors here. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arpiano. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. This is actually an honor to be invited to participate in this event. And first, Roberto, thank you very much for uh, uh, letting me participate in this program and for your initiative to introduce space activities in Ecuador. That makes a difference. So you are also very enthusiastic. And also, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Geronimo Casanello because you gave a quick overview of some of the main aspects related to space medicine. So I will not have to repeat any of those things, but what I'm going to share with you is our experience concerning uh, commercial space transportation, because that's obviously the new field that we are involved with. So this is where I'm from. Uh, I'm the director of the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute in Oklahoma City. So since 1998, we became uh, involved with commercial space transportation, coming up with plans for medical certification issues, uh, research in human factors in aerospace medicine. So we continue uh, interacting with all of the medical departments of the current commercial space transportation companies in the United States. And we have been working together to develop not only standards, but to develop recommendations, guidance. In fact, we just finished one meeting yesterday talking about what should be research priorities in support of commercial space transportation for spaceflight participants and for the crew members. Now, when I say spaceflight participant, that's the technical term that we're using for passengers. We don't call them space passengers. The uh, uh, legal name is spaceflight participants. So let, let me start with this, because Albert Einstein said, I never think of the future, it comes soon enough. And what that means is that actually the development of this industry is going very fast to the point that in some cases we are catching up with what's going on with the transportation technology. But we have to make sure that we are going to stay ahead because of all the different challenges. Just to give you a quick overview, in November of 1995, that's when the responsibility for commercial space transportation came to, all, came to the Department of Transportation, the DOT. Then from there came to the FAA and that established the new Office of Commercial Space Transportation. So at the present time, the United States is the only country in the world that has established licensing requirements for manned commercial space operations. Europe has done uh, tried to establish standards as well. However, they have used the standards for aviation, and in our case, are special standards for space. Now, as far as our mission is, we need to issue all of these licenses for commercial space operations, but it has to include the launch sites, in this case, the spaceports, re-entry operations and re-entry sites. But also at the same time, our responsibility is to promote the development and growth of the industry. So it's safety and at the same time, development of the industry. But then as a third bullet, we have to protect the health and safety of the public and what that means is we don't want any of these vehicles to crash on the ground and then injure people on the ground or damage property on the ground or affect the national security of the United States. So we are protecting what is called the uninvolved public. So to give a couple of ideas of the suborbital launch vehicles under development that we are involved with, that we are having discussions with, Blue Origin, as, uh, uh, as uh, Roberto already mentioned, that they will be 
uh, launching very soon with Jeff Bezos, que es el, el CEO, he's the CEO of this company. So this is one of the suborbital space vehicles. We have another one, which is Spaceship 2, which has been operated by Virgin Galactic. And in fact, we just had a meeting last week concerning what should be the additional medical issues, particularly for people who may have some kind of handicaps or some kind of disabilities. Then uh, we're talking about high altitude balloons. In fact, we have one operation that is starting in Colorado, which we, with uh, this, this uh, particular uh, product, which is the Voyager. So the difference is that in one of the previous vehicles, you may be able to be in microgravity for about three to four minutes maximum at an altitude of 62 miles or 100 kilometers. In this one, you can go to 32, uh, 32 miles. And at that altitude, you see the curvature of Earth, but then you can stay up there for up to one hour. So this is also going to be a little bit cheaper than on the other developments or the, or the other vehicles. So as far as orbital vehicles, we also have interactions with all of these. The Falcon Heavy from SpaceX, Launcher One, you have, uh, in this case, is the Virgin Galactic, but the other version for cargo, Blue Origin, you have NASA, the CST, and I will show you a couple of other ones. Strato launch, that has been a very interesting development because this was, it is, it is today the biggest airplane in the world, which was equivalent of two, two Boeing 747s connected. This was going to include an orbital space vehicle with potentially also a, a crew, crew vehicle right here. But when John Allen, who was the owner and the founder of Microsoft, uh, company died, this company actually uh, was purchased by another one. And this is the actual vehicle that is being uh, flight tested. It is the size of a football field. And uh, this is in flight, but now they have changed. They are no longer going to have their own operation to space, but now they are going to use this and offer it for anybody who wants to use it as a test bed to develop other uh, rockets, rocket-powered vehicles, or hypersonic vehicles. So essentially, they become a service provider for very high altitude operations. Now, when we talk about the specific orbital vehicles, we have the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser that continues the development with some money from the FAA. Of course, you have been seeing the flights of the SpaceX, the Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. Boeing is also developing the Commercial Space Transportation Vehicle 100, and Lockheed has been working on the Orion. But also in Russia, they are the, pursuing the development of an equivalent which is called the PPST. But this is another player, and this is Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow has been developing an inflatable space habitat. And in fact, this is not a new technology. He actually bought the original rights to a technology developed by NASA and he's now developing this privately. He already has one of his modules attached to the International Space Station, but he wants to have his own space station. And essentially, this is giving him the experience with the ISS to have his own. And then eventually, with minor modifications, this space station can actually be become a moon base. So we have been dealing with more than 59 years of human spaceflight where we have been carrying humans, starting with Yuri Gagarin in 1961. And let me show, show you right now the development of spaceports. Here we have the existing orbital sites in blue, proposed orbital sites around the world in brown, proposed suborbital flights in red, and existing suborbital. So in the United States alone, we have six, we have actually now seven new commercial spaceports. In, in fact, we have one here, in Oklahoma, and there will be more. There are proposals to have another one in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, or here in the narrow part of Mexico. There have been some discussions about also one in Chile, and hopefully there may be one in Costa Rica at some point. So from a regulatory point of view, uh, which connects to the medical aspects is that under this law that we passed in 2004, it requires for all of these commercial space operators to share with anybody who wants to fly in space, the potential risks of participating in flights. And then they have to fly at their own risk. They have to sign an informed consent. 
But what kind of risks are the ones that should be disclosed so that you minimize the liability, the legal liability for the operator, but then you don't scare people and now they don't want to go to space? Well, the law in the United States is very specific. You have to inform each flight participant in writing about the risks of the launch and re-entry, including all of the medical risks. And it goes beyond that. For each mission, each non-hazard and risk that could result in a serious injury, in death, disability, or total or partial loss of physical or mental function. What does that mean? That they have to learn what could happen to them. Therefore, the company has the responsibility to tell them what are all the different things that could happen to them. And also that there are some hazards that we don't even know. And they have to know that they could die in space operations, but they have to take the risk themselves. So why risk disclosure is important? Because of space attorneys. And in fact, we have the International Institute of Space Law. We have associations of space laws. And obviously they are interested in liability issues if something happens so that they can sue and they can recover some compensation for damages cost, okay? So that's why it's very important to disclose the risks. At the same time, the public has the right to take some personal risk. I like this uh, that Michelangelo said, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. What this means is we need to take risks. If we don't take risks, we do not advance. And some of the risks are risks that we don't know. They are risks in disguise. They are risks that we cannot even explain because we don't know all of the risks. So as a result of that, it's important to have a good conversation with commercial space flight participants, but we have to have an, an, an effective multidisciplinary approach to explain everything and share with them everything. So what are the risks in space? Is it risky to fly in space? Yes, but there is very depend upon if it was if it's orbital flight or an orbital flight. For, for medical reasons, there are these people who can fly suborbital but will never be able to fly orbital just because of the duration of the flight and because of the type of medical problems. But also there is a difference between short flights and long flights. And there is also very important to understand that at this point in time, the populations impacted by commercial space flights are the crew members, the pilot, co-pilot, and the space flight participants. In this case, the people who are not controlling the vehicle. So from that point of view, we have to think about all of these in factors, individual, and I'm not, I don't have time. We could spend hours talking about number two and number three, but that would be for another presentation in the future. But we need to think about what may, could have an impact on the human, all the way from what could happen as a result of medications, as a result of all of these impacts of uh, these different sub substances. To give an example, when you fly as a passenger in an airline aircraft, you can drink alcohol, you can take your medications, you can do many things that you do on Earth. But if you go in a commercial space vehicle, it would be very difficult to allow these people to drink alcohol. It would be very difficult for them. Even some of the medications do not have the same effect in microgravity. And essentially for practical purposes, you cannot take anything or you should not take anything by mouth because the movement of the intestines slows down and in some cases it even stops. Therefore, if you rely on absorbing medication in your intestines, that may not be a good idea. So what else do we have to think about? And, uh oh, something happened here. Okay, here we go. So do we know all of the medical risks of flying in space? And the answer is no. We do not, we have very limited experience and knowledge with people who have medical problems. Why? Because most people who have flown in space have been astronauts, cosmonauts, and now taikonauts, or what we can call them in general, career astronauts, who are general, nor, generally normal. However, that doesn't mean that they are completely healthy. Now, also another issue is EH. When John Glenn flew for the first time, he was 40 years old. He flew again when he was 77 years old. That doesn't mean that he was completely healthy when he flew the se second time. But the second time he was not 
the astronaut in command. The second time, he was a mission specialist. So he had no responsibility for the safety of the flight. And that's why he got medical waivers to be allowed to fly in space the second time. So what medical data is available to the public? And I will share with you several ones. We have experience with US government space program. And related to that, let me share with you. These are examples of medical issues that happen to astronauts, have happened to astronauts on the ground, not in flight, but while they're on the ground. And look at all of these different medical conditions. So what, does, what that tells you is that even astronauts who are career astronauts, who are very healthy, they also develop medical issues. They're people. And here the list continues. This is just the first page. Here is the second page. So we cannot assume that for, the, for people who are from the general population, they will have less problems. They may have even more problems. Why? Because they are not selected as strictly as uh, professional astronauts. So what additional experience do we have? Well, we also have uh, in-flight experience. But let me jump to this one. I like this study because it covered 106 space shuttle missions between 1981 and December 2001 with 607 astronauts, some of them repetitive flights. So not individual astronauts, but many of them multiple flights. That many men, that many women, that many flight days. And look at this. 98% of men and 94% of women reported that many medical events or symptoms during flight. And they are, once again, the very healthy. So here you have the types of medical symptoms that have experienced in flight. And here the list continues. So yes, even the highly selected professional astronauts also develop symptoms in space, which means we don't know all of the reasons. And also we have 194 events due to injuries. In microgravity, it is easy that you may suffer concussions, contusions, and other injuries because you are floating in microgravity. And if you don't control your translation from one point to another point in microgravity, you can hit yourself against structures, even though they are protected, but you can still have problems. Then what about long duration orbital flights? And here I will share with you the second one, which is in-flight medical events among United States astronauts between 1995 and 1998. So what kind of medical problems did we see? And all of this. So you have musculoskeletal problems, skin, nasal congestion and irritation, all of these issues, okay? And that doesn't mean that that was the total number. Those are the ones that were reported by the astronauts. But you can think that there are more that were not reported. So here you continue with this. Look at this. Just arrhythmias and conduction disorders of the heart, 128 incidents of that. Look at this on musculoskeletal, 29. Surface injuries, once again, because of what I shared with you. Headaches are very common because of the fluid shifts in microgravity. So suddenly you have an increased airflow going to your brain. So that's not surprising that you have headaches. And here you have the list. The list continues and continues and continues. So once again, these are the very healthy individuals. So, and just to give you a practical example, in October 22, 1968, Apollo 7, the three astronauts who flew in that one, Shira, who was the commander, developed uh, un resfriado en vuelo. F 15 hours into the flight, he uh, made the other two sick. So they ended up using almost all of the clinics that they carried on board, but they needed to return and they didn't want to put their helmets on because they said that if they started sneezing, that then their snot was going to cover the interior of the visors. Well, they disobeyed that direct order. As, and as a result of disobeying a, a direct order, they never flew in space again. So something as simple as a cold after this is when it was implemented the quarantine process for astronauts before they go in space. So what about commercial orbital spaceflight participants? We have already had commercial spaceflight participants in orbital flights. We have Dennis Tito, who was the first one. The, uh, he was 57 years old when he flew. He had a history of pneumothorax, emphysema, parenchyma that we thought it was tuberculosis, 
intestinal masses and pulmonary masses that initially, hmm, is that cancer? And ventricular and atrial ectopy. Well, he was treated for all of these conditions. Then he was medically evaluated in analog environments, including putting him in an altitude chamber to see how he would do with uh, pressure changes, a uh, mixed gas simulation to see different levels of hypoxia, a zero G flight or parabolic flight, microgravity exposure, and then finally a high G centrifuge to simulate the stress of the launch and return. So he passed everything, flew in space and came back, no problem. So as a result of that, excuse me, it was great, uh, Dr. Olsen, his decision was to, op to share all of his medical issues. So there was an article that was published about him in one of our scientific journals describing everything that happened to him. So what does this mean? That when we have people like those, we are getting critical experience with known career astronauts with certain medical issues. And that experience is very, very important if we want to let people go with other medical conditions, okay? It provides medical knowledge that will be valuable for future space exploration. Then if you have other people with other operators with similar medical conditions, now if you already flew something with something similar, it is easier to prove that person to fly in another company. And demonstrates that flight participants and their medical doctors can evaluate and accept medical risks as long as they do for a very good pre-flight assessment. So what is the medical screening guidance for commercial space flights? Well, we actually developed some in the FAA. And the question was, what is the minimum right stuff? What is the minimum necessary for passengers or commercial space flight participants in commercial space flights? So we consider these four main stress factors for these space flight participants. Acceleration and deceleration of the vehicle, changes in barometric pressure on board the vehicle, Exposure to microgravity in suborbital flights, very short, three to four minutes. Suborbital flight, longer. Exposure to radiation, both solar and cosmic. For suborbital flights, not a big deal. For orbital flights, it is a big deal. So, and we developed this medical guidance based on the following assumptions. That it was, in these vehicles, an in-flight carrying environment not exceeding 8,000 feet, which is equivalent to what we experience in most airline flights, like when you go from uh, America to uh, Europe, inside the aircraft is the equivalent of 8,000 feet. Well, something similar, and passengers will be able to perform an emergency evacuation without assistance. In other words, they will get out by themselves. So over the years we develop, and we were involved in all of these activities. This was one set of medical guidance for space passengers from the Aerospace Medical Association when I was a president. That was in 2001. Then we had another one that I led a group in the International Academy of Astronautics, where we published in 2009, another report for short duration commercial orbital flights. We had another one from the Aerospace Medical Association in 2002. Then we produced our own from the FAA in 2006. Then we have another one from asthma in 2009. Then we have another one from asthma in 2010. Then through the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, we actually formed another group, Suborbital Space Safety, and we developed some guidance for that as well. But the one that today is, uh, this is the one for short duration commercial orbital flights. That one included also considerations about liability. So we have a section that included what should be the concern for medical doctors making the decision of letting passengers to fly in space if something happened to the passengers in space. Would the medical doctors be sued if something happened to the, the space flight participants in space? So we included a chapter on medical liability issues in that one. And the one that is currently the guidance that is being used and has been used now for, for years around the world is one that we developed under the FAA Commercial Space Transportation Center of Excellence, where we cover both flight crew medical standards for the pilots and space flight participant medical acceptance guidance, what you want to call for the passengers. Okay, 
So we included several participants in this uh, group that we put together from NASA, from the Space Medicine branch of the Aerospace Medical Association, from the FAA, from the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, the International Academy of Astronautics, and the Aerospace Medical Association. And we collected, I'm not going to go into all of these details, but what we did is we prepared a consolidated set of recommendations for medical certification of the crew members and the acceptance for spaceflight participants. And this report was provided back to us, to the FAA, as part of the Center of Excellence in Commercial Space Transportation task. So the commercial, with what is going on with this report, we have had, it is being used as a baseline by, space, by Virgin Galactic. It is also being used for consideration by SpaceX. It is being used for consideration by Blue Origin. So it is being used by all of these companies. And since they are required to inform spaceflight participants about the risk, well, we included also a section on training. So this report, we consider the minimum recommended as opposed to what other agencies like NASA, they do that they have the maximum. So we have these four sections in that document, spaceflight participant acceptance guidelines, suborbital, and also for them orbital, and then for pilots, suborbital, and for pilots, orbital. So if you want a copy of this document, I will leave it here for a second. You can go here and you can get a copy of this final report. Now, this final report is currently being used by another group that we formed starting on April of last year. And this group, which is ASTM, which is an international standards organization, we're using what we suggested in this report to actually propose two sets of medical certification standards that would come to the FAA, both for orbital and suborbital flights. In fact, this morning, we were discussing the, la the latest draft that we have in this particular report. So from the FAA perspective, what are we doing for pilots? For pilots, what we require right now is a class two pilot medical certificate. That's like the same certificate that we use for aviation pilots. That's what we are requiring currently for commercial space pilots. Now, our philosophy is different than NASA because when NASA is selecting astronauts, they are selecting people to work for them for many years. They're expecting that when they select astronauts, they will keep working at NASA for at least 20 years. So they are hiring employees and they're investing on those employees because the astronaut training is extremely expensive, millions of dollars. Therefore, they want to be very strict on the medical screening and the medical selection because they will be working for a long time. When we're talking about space crew members, it's not the same consideration. It's a little bit different. And for space flight participants, even less because they may only fly one time. So what is the minimum right stuff for passengers in commercial space flights? Well, that's what we did in 2005 in our guidance for medical screening of commercial aerospace passengers, the one that we developed in the FAA. So in that one, we had two main considerations. What could we do to promote the preservation of life and the safety of the flight, and at the same time, not impose an obstacle for the development of the industry? Why? Remember, the FAA has two missions in commercial space, safety and promotion of the development of the industry. So we have to have the compatibility with both. If we become too strict on medical screening and medical certification standards, almost nobody from the general public is going to fly. So we cannot do that. And we identify the more four main areas of concern, once again, that I shared before. But what was it that we did? We divided the medical screening in two different groups. Those for suborbital flights or exposed to an acceleration load of up to two, up to positive three GZ. That means three times the force of gravity applying from the head to the feet during any phase of the flight. So if you're in a suborbital flight or under that acceleration load, the, co the people only need to do is complete, complete a medical history questionnaire before every flight. Then a company physician 
that we recommend that should be trained in aerospace medicine. And in fact, all of the current companies, that's what they have done. In fact, they have selected aerospace medicine specialists. They will review the questionnaire. If they have any concerns or any, any, any issues, then it is them that will say that they will require additional physical examination, complete laboratory testing, and any other medical tests. But that's a decision based on the initial screening. Not everybody the same. Now, what do we do or what do we, do we recommend for orbital flights or exposed to an acceleration profile more than three positive GZ? Once again, from the head to the feet, that kind of acceleration. So here is different. They complete the medical history questionnaire. They undergo a physical examination with laboratory tests that we listed which tests. And we recommended that should be valid for a period of one year only. So if it takes you longer than one year to fly, the exam needs to be repeated. So some, uh, this was the criteria, medical conditions that may contraindicate or may prevent participation in orbital or space flight. This is kind of a, una, una idea de escopeta. Any deformities, diseases, illnesses, injuries, anything medical that can happen to you that could result in in-flight death, could result in an in-flight medical emergency, could interfere with the operation of personal protective equipment, oxygen system, uh, your, flights, your uh, flight suit, your, uh, your helmet, whatever, personal equipment. Interfere with the in-flight emergency procedures or emergency evacuation, or anything that could compromise the health and safety of everybody else. And that includes the crew and other spaceflight participants. So those are the conditions that could result. However, we, uh, some medical conditions may be cleared. So we, we may give medical waivers if we do some tests that could use a zero G aircraft, a high performance aircraft to simulate acceleration exposure, a hyperbaric chamber to simulate pressure, pressure uh, changes, and a human centrifuge. And that's what has been going on. So using a flexible approach that applies all of this aerospace medicine knowledge and experience, then we can provide special accommodations to participants who have certain pathologies, including disabilities. And in fact, that's a group right now that we identify as part of the other group, identifying research needs, medical research needs for commercial space transportation. We have to find a way to accommodate people with disabilities people with prosthetic legs, with people with prosthetic arms, with prosthetic hands, with some kind of mobility impairments, we need to find a way to make them fly so that we are not discriminating against them. So to give you an example, using all of these different types of equipment, the zero G or parabolic flight, the altitude chambers, we have a human centrifuge. Those are analog systems. What's an example? Professor Hawking, Stephen Hawking. You remember all of the medical issues that he had, but the main one was lateral sclerosis, advanced. But he wanted to fly in space. In fact, he wanted to go to the moon and he wanted to go to Mars. So the first thing was to fly him in a parabolic flight. So in order to do that, what was done is to put him, uh, well, to actually to have a medical team to have a preparation. So it was having a healthy volunteer to simulate to be Stephen Hawking, then uh, identify what kind of medical equipment was going to be carried on board that flight based on his medical problems, and then do a practical simulation of possible in-flight medical emergencies with the person who was pretending to be Stephen Hawking. So it was done. Then based on that, there was confidence that he could be flown in the zero G flight, and he was. Now, this was the person who pretended to be him first, but then there is Stephen Hawking. And look at that big smile. He was happy. Now, what was not disclosed that initially they were only going to fly him for three to four parabolas, and that was it. When he knew that he was only be allowed to fly for three to four parabolas, he said, no, you have a specific number of parabolas planned for this flight. You will let me fly all of them. And look at this, it was a successful thing, it was flown, it was flown just for him. So what this means is that 
This demonstrated that you can have selected individuals with severe pathologies to participate in short duration space flights as well. But you have to have very good pre-flight aeromedical preparation, biomedical monitoring instrumentation, including equipment and any supplies if you need to provide medical care. And it may require a special flight just for that person. So if you have a millionaire who wants to fly, why not if he decides to fly just himself and hire the entire flight just for him? So what this says is that medicine is a science, but it's also an art. And since we don't know everything from a medical and physiological point of view that can happen in space and psychological, we have to make calculated risk decisions. So what's the key to commercial space transportation? Human space flight is the medical waiver process, las dispensas médicas, that's the key. Why it is recommended that we implement non-invasive biomedical monitoring of space flight participants. And some of the medical variables for biomedical monitoring, these are the ones that in another study we are recommended. Now, this monitoring system should be definitely fully portable. It has to be small, low volume, low weight, self-powered, and is not likely to cause electromagnetic interference with equipment on board the space vehicle. So it has to meet all of the requirements of anything that you carry in space. But if you have all of these, why not? Why? Because commercial space flights will create the opportunity for non-career astronauts to fly, but at the same time, the more people we let flying in space with medical problems, the more experience we are going to get. And the more experience we get with people with medical problems, the more flexible we become for future flights. So it makes perfect sense to take calculated risks, but to let people fly with medical problems. But then another thing that becomes very critical, the medical databases. Because whatever we collect medical information, pre-flight, during flight, and post-flight, that is information that should be shared with the entire industry. Because then if you have one operator that already had experience with some spaceflight participant, with some medical issues, and everything went well, it should be shared with everybody else because you don't want another operator not to have similar experience, but then have a bad experience that will affect the entire industry. So all medical information collected in archived databases should they always also be protected because of medical legal privacy rights, but you can de-identify and still share. And the post-flight medical debriefs of space flight participants are very, very uh, important and highly recommended. So one way to standardize and facilitate the post-flight medical debriefs is to develop a questionnaire that is standardized across the entire industry. So other guidance. This was another issue that we had to deal with. Should we allow newborns, infants, and toddlers to fly in space? Unfortunately, we do not have any experience from NASA or from Russia or from now even from the Chinese of infants or young children flying in space. Therefore, we cannot quantify the risk. Therefore, we recommended that the commercial space operators should establish a minimum age for people who participate. Because remember, the requirement is that they have to understand all of the risks. Children will not understand the risks. But if they are at least 18 years old, who are legally adults, they should be allowed to fly. So the industry so far has accepted that recommendation that we gave them. Another issue became pregnancy. We haven't had pregnant women in space. So could we have medical emergencies among pregnant women? Yes, particularly think about what's the incidence of ectopic pregnancies on the ground in the general population. And what is the incidence of spontaneous abortions? And we have, at least in the United States, it's about 25%. So what happens if you have a, a spontaneous abortion or an ectopic pregnancy that starts bleeding in space? That would be a medical emergency so that should not be acceptable. So we recommended to the industry that at least initially they should not allow pregnant women to fly in space. And that's what they are doing. They are not going to allow them because there are several risk factors. You include, of course, the radiation exposure, 
But a big concern is acceleration and microgravity. We have no idea what will be the impact of this. So later, if we gain experience, we may change the decision, but at this point, it's not a good idea. Now, a controversial consideration is, let's say that today you are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and it's late stage pancreatic cancer. And you know that your survivability may be less than a year, in some cases, maybe three to six months. So we ask the question, how many people in the medical profession would allow that person to fly in space, even though it's terminal of cancer, but that person wanted to fly before dying, and the person is going to die anyway. So I cannot see you, but usually 50% of the physicians that hear this, they will say, yes, I would allow that person to fly. And I'm among those. I would say, yes, let these people fly. Now, if they want to have a special flight for them, why not? You're not putting anybody else at risk. And you know that they have a serious medical condition that you are not likely to make it worse by allowing them to fly in space. So yes, this will still be a difficult decision because of ethical, but mainly because of legal, legal implications, even though they can sign an informed consent. So also, we have to consider that for suborbital flights, forget about medical care. The flights are so short. The entire flight profile in suborbital flight is about two hours. So you first you go to a high altitude about 60, 50, 60,000 feet, and then from there you proceed to space flight. Well, the issue is that you will only be in space for about three to four minutes in suborbital flights. You don't have enough time to treat any kind of medical emergency. And particularly in small vehicles like the Spaceship 2 or like the Blue Origin capsule, or even the SpaceX capsule, and that in that case is orbit, orbital, not orbital. But even in those cases, there is no time for you to do anything. So you have to choose people who are not likely to die in that short time flight. Okay. So the one consideration is that something beyond that. So let me cover a little bit of the other issues. And on the external environmental factors, you remember I told you that we have to share all of the potential risks to the passengers is not only the medical risks. You have to talk about the operational risks. You have to talk about the weather, about wildlife strikes like birds, decompression or barometric pressure changes, ambient temperature, you have to talk about freezing conditions or actually overheating, ionization, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation, space debris, particularly for orbital flights, not that much for suborbital, and microgravity for both groups, suborbital and orbital. But let me give you some examples. Let's say that you take off in a vehicle like the Spaceship 2, which is an airplane, and you have the space vehicle in the center. You have to start this close and research as this is a crosswind landing, okay? Look at the pilot still trying to land there. That's a risk, very, very high risk. So. Do you disclose to potential spaceflight participants the potential weather risk like this? This is, a, for example, lightning hitting a Boeing 747. That no problem because it's an aluminum structure and you dissipate the energy that enters the aircraft. But all commercial space vehicles are being developed using composite materials that do not conduct electricity. So they can be damaged by being hit by lightning. Is that theory? It's not theory. Apollo 12 in 1969 was hit twice after uh, one before uh, uh, liftoff and the second one after liftoff. Fortunately, nothing happened. There were some electrical problems, but there were not big problems. However, in 1987, the Atlas Center was affected four times by lightning. The lightning affected the, the guidance system of the vehicle, and it was going to go, of course, in the direction of populated areas. So it was necessary to destroy the vehicle from the ground, make it explode in flight so that it would not injure people on the ground. So one thing that you may not know, but the space shuttle at NASA carry a system where you could actually destroy the vehicle in flight if there was a possibility of going off course and let's say instead of launching into the ocean, 
could go opposed to the ocean and then compromise, let's say, a big city. That was not acceptable. Would it be acceptable to tell spaceflight participants in commercial space vehicles to tell them, sorry, if your vehicle goes off course, we may have to destroy you in flight. That will never happen in commercial space transportation. Here you have other incidents of lightning on the space shuttle. This is another problem with hail, granizo. Granizo is a big problem in uh, aviation, but it's not theoretical. It has also damaged vehicles for space flight. The space shuttle was damaged several times by, by hail. Then we have issues about ice formation. It's not only aviation. What brought the, ch the space shuttle Challenger down? It was the formation of flight and the freezing of the rings between the sections of the main, the main rocket here. So that's what destroyed it. So strong winds, those could cause problems. Here is the bird strikes. This is damage that could be caused to airplanes by birds. And you can say, well, that's just airplanes. No, the space shuttle in 2005 was hit by a vulture. Fortunately, it hit on this side. If it had hit here, it would have destroyed tiles. And if you remember what was the problem for the Columbia accident, the tiles were damaged during launch, and then the vehicle was destroyed coming back to Earth. That could have happened because of a bird. So you have to consider that. And these are woodpeckers, pájaros carpinteros, that damage the insulation material of the space shuttle. So we have to think about animals as well. Decompression. Decompression is a problem not only for aviation. We have had in space transportation, and I will jump this, it was on Soyuz 11, the three cosmonauts died because they have a decompression in flight 30 minutes before landing because a valve depressurized the spacecraft. And up to this flight, they never had full pressure suits. After this accident, it was required that all cosmonauts should have a full pressure suit on. And right now for commercial space vehicles, not all of them will require a commercial space, uh, excuse me, a, a full pressure suit, okay? And the Progress M M94, you remember, that crash with the uh, Mir space station, they almost lost the entire Mir space station, but it is something that you have to be prepared for, particularly if we end up having also commercial space stations. Spaceship One and Spaceship Two, as I mentioned to you, they don't have full pressure suits. Why? Because the fuselage has two layers and that's considered the backup in case that there is perforation of the fuselage. So it has its own backup. And the space debris risks, those will be risks for orbital space vehicles. So there are tons and tons of space debris that could have significant damage, even to the point that on the life of the International Space Station, well, let me jump this, these are the high impact risk areas on the International Space Station that could actually result in destroying the International Space Station. The probability of catastrophic damage was 18% chance that debris impact with a force abandoning the Inter International Space Station. Fortunately, what they have done is they have changed the altitude to avoid hitting big pieces of garbage in space. And here the, the, the calculation is there is a 9% chance of penetration that would lead to loss of the station and all of its occupants. So yes, that is also a risk. So with that, let me stop right here because now I'm one minute exceeding my time. Dr. Duenio, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Great, great information about what is happening and how people have to be uh, aware if they definitely want to embark on this journey. And uh, we were hoping for Dr. Palacios to join us, but he had an emergency and he's with a patient right now in surgery. So Dr. Jorge Palacios is not going to be able to join. But uh, now we'll go to the questions and answers session. So if anybody has a question, please write it down in the chat and, and we can go ahead and read it. Uh, we have the first question to start. It is by Marcos Moreira that he asked Dr. Antuñano, uh, are there any treatments or medicines to prepare the human body for a long stay in space? That's, that's a good question. 
I wish we had them, <laughs> but we don't. What we currently have to use is um, countermeasures. So that's why you see, and you have seen many uh, uh, movies, and you see also in a t television, that they have to exercise in space. So they have to exercise several hours to try to prevent the atrophy of muscles. Why? Because muscles in microgravity, you are not even supporting your own weight because you are free floating. So you have to make a point of exercising, trying to decrease the loss of muscle. You don't eliminate completely the loss of muscle, but you prevent. The same thing with bone loss. Since you don't have any weight on your body and you don't have any weight on your skeleton, particularly the skeleton along the spine and all of the bones that are supporting your weight, you start losing bone almost right away. So by doing exercise, you are also with the activity of the muscles, you're also creating some stress for your bones. So that also helps you prevent, but you don't prevent it completely. In fact, with the astronaut who has the record for turning in space, uh, Valery Polyakov from Russia, he, when he returned to Earth, he never ever recovered completely his entire bone mass. And that's the case even today with all of the astronauts that are staying on the International Space Station, plus you recover bone, but it's not the same type of bone. You have the bone, the uh, spongy bone, and then you have the cortical bone. So you have the tendency to lose a lot of the cortical bone, which is the one outside that provides the strength, and you lose less of the spongy bone. Well, you need it when you come back to Earth. So the issue now becomes, if you go in a very long flight, how are we going to prevent these people from having fractures when they return to Earth? So. There are studies going on with electrical stimulation. There are studies going on with some, some particular substances to see if we can increase the uh, absorption of calcium to the bones and the accumulation of calcium and decrease the loss of bone. Then there are other studies of artificial gravity. But artificial gravity is easy to say, is difficult to accomplish. And at the same time, they are starting to look into well, can we find, for example, people from a genomic perspective that they have more tolerance to not losing bone than others? Therefore, so should we use genomics and genetic markers to identify people who have a better tolerance to microgravity exposure and less effects related to that? So there is interest looking at that. And there is interest looking even now at the microbiome. The microbiome in your intestines that controls a lot of what you uh, absorb through your intestines. So could we increase the absorption of calcium and then make sure that the calcium gets to the bones, gets deposited, and then you have lower, lower uh, loss of calcium. But then you have also the issue that even with the bone that you're losing, if you have right now at NASA, if you have a history of having uh, form a kidney stone or a gallbladder stone when you are being selected as an astronaut, you will not be selected. Because you could, uh, like a kidney stone, you could form a stone in a couple of days in microgravity. So you don't want to select those people, so you eliminate them if they have medical history, and in some cases, strong family history of kidney stones may be disqualifying for selection as an astronaut. As a commercial spaceflight participant, yes, you are welcome. So that's where we are going to have a lot of flexibility, commercial space to let many people fly with all kinds of of medical issues. Thank you. That, that's wonderful. Now, now we have a question for Dr. Casanello. Uh, Dr. Casanello, do you think that Ecuador, with its geographic locations and the high altitude and the volcanoes that we have, is that something maybe that could be a great opportunity for research where we can take advantage of, of our position with the Andes and how that relates? What are your thoughts about that? Well, thank you. I, really, I am, I am not an expert about this this topic, but uh, I, I believe that maybe it's a good a good situation for the landing and for the uh, how do you say the when you go up in the, to the sky, uh, the first part of the of the journey, and um, also maybe because uh, these people who live in highlands are going to they are uh, they live with low oxygen in the atmosphere for example they also have the, the same 
same oxygen, oxygen, but they can can take a lower levels. So maybe they are prepared for a situation like epoxy, epoxia. Uh, you can you can find that even in commercial flights. If you have a problem with your oxygen, your blood, you cannot take a, a commercial flight. And maybe they can have another another type of people to have a, a different experience because they have more even blood in their systems. And it's, it's a good point to to explore in, in the space. I don't know if they have a, maybe an advantage, but it's, it's good for that. You have the, the both points, you know, the, the, the technique part of the journey and the medical part of them. Let me, Perfect. Let me Thank have you a comment to that, because mm -hmm. there is another thing that you could do in Ecuador. In Ecuador, you have high, high elevation areas. You also have some kind of desertic areas in Ecuador as well. You can do what is being done in some places like in Arizona and other locations where you could actually create simulated environments to train potential astronauts in isolation. So if you develop a mock-up, let's say, of a lunar base simulated there, and then have simulated spacesuits, you can establish analog missions that you say, okay, we're going to learn about uh, food, we're going to learn about other things, the supply and how capable you are to live in those conditions of isolation in a simulated environment away from everybody. So that's a possibility that you could implement something like that that doesn't exist in Latin America right now. Nobody's thinking about doing anything like that. And something, another aspect is the, for example, the experience with people who diving, who make dive, because they also have some problems when they take commercial flight, if they have to uh, dive in 12, or 12 hours before the flight. So that is another interesting thing because you know in the in Ecuador you can you can be in the beach and in thirty minutes you can go to the highlands. You know? They change very very quickly so from the environment. Yes, because of that concern, initially in the International Space Station, they were going to install a small hyperbaric chamber to treat for decompression sickness, the same sickness of the scuba divers. But also yes. you can have the same sickness or decompression sickness if you're in a space suit and you have a sudden decompression when you're outside. You can develop also bubbles in your bloodstream, just like a scuba diver going to the surface too fast. But it was going to be very expensive and very complicated to put it on the International Space Station. So instead of that, they change the procedure where before you go on an extravehicular activity, you have to actually exercise at 75% of your maximum aerobic capacity for up to one hour to try to eliminate nitrogen from your body so that way you don't form bubbles if you're exposed to a decompression. That was easier to change the process than to carry a hyperbaric chamber on board the International Space Station. But you're right, we have to worry about that as well. So, so thinking about that, Dr. Tuñano, if we just imagine a little bit about the future when we have point-to-point -point transportation. And point-to-point -point transportation is just having hypersonic vehicles that are really, really fast or other type of vehicles that can really facilitate moving between the Earth for, for, for the rest of the group. So if somebody comes from Japan to Ecuador in an hypersonic vehicle and then they would like to go on a suborbital flight, then do you think that they should wait before doing that or is that something that they can do instantaneously. How do you perceive that? Well, it depends on what is the pressurization of the vehicle, okay? So if you maintain as close to ground level the pressurization as possible, there may not be a problem. Now, if, if it is not like that, then yes, you have to wait for at least 24 hours before you would go into the commercial space flight. But in order to prevent that problem, what the commercial space operators are going to be requiring is that people that they fly them in their vehicles, they will have to arrive to the launch facility several days before the launch. So that way they will be adapted to the local conditions, they will be adapted already to the local altitude, the whole thing. That way they don't have to worry about flying just the same day <laughs> before. Now, could somebody try? I guess they are millionaires and billionaires, so they may want to do it. However, finally it's up to the company to decide if they want to take the risk of being sued. 
And here is a, a, an interesting thing, because let's say that you're a millionaire billionaire. You go in the commercial space vehicle, and for whatever reason, you die. You are not going to sue the company because you are dead. <laughs> but who is likely to sue the company? The family. So what we recommended to the space flight companies is that they should have also the spouses and the children, all of the near relatives, to also sign the informed consent so that they don't sue the company if something happens to their father, their mother, their children, or whoever. So that's one way of dealing. At this point in time, the only company in the world that is willing to give you life insurance if you fly in commercial space is the Lloyds of London. And it's a very expensive insurance policy. Nobody else is willing to give you an insurance policy. <laughs> we have a question from Jaime Carbo, one of our participants, and he wants to know about bond loss in microgravity. And what is the best way to recuperate once you return from a trip? Well, uh, the best, let's start before you return, as I said before, exercise a lot while you're in space. A lot, a lot, exercise that. Then when you come back, as soon as you come back, continue exercising, but then progressively increase the intensity of the exercise. You have noticed that when the astronauts come back on the Soyuz vehicle, they never come out of the capsule walking. They're always taken out and they are always scary. Why? Because the Soyuz vehicle has a higher G load, a higher acceleration load on the return. Because in CD's higher acceleration load, if they tried to stand up, they would become unconscious <laughs> because they were already exposed to acceleration on the return. So they carry them out so that they show to the public that they're okay. But if you remember in the space shuttle, the return, the astronauts would not come out of the space shuttle immediately after it landed. Sometimes it would take 30, 45 minutes to come out. Why? Because they were preparing them to make sure that they could climb down the stairs from the space shuttle. And if one of them had a problem, they would prehydrate them with intravenous solution before leaving the space shuttle. So they would have increased fluid so they would not lose consciousness or have what is called orthostatic hypotension. So you have to get back, exercise, increase the intensity of the exercise up to the point where you start recovering. And of course, they will do bone scans to check how, fa how fast you are recovering your, your bone. But that's what Medica you can do. Medications, with medications, nothing works. Somebody recommended for women, when they have menopause, there are some treatments for women to uh, help them prevent bone loss because of osteoporosis. Well, somebody said, why don't we use the same medication for astronauts so they don't lose bone like women who are menopausic? Doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. The mechanisms are different. <laughs> so if you come up with another solution, use creativity, you may come up with a suggestion that probably can be explored. <laughs> Dr. Casanello, do you have any questions that you would like to make to Dr. Antoniano? I have a question that is going to, to touch an ethical issue here. <laughs> uh, it's very, very hard. <laughs> Sorry, but it's, it's, we are talking about physiology in the space. Yes. And of course, uh, the astronauts are professionals, they are working, but I want to know if there is uh, something related to the sexual component of the human body. I, I don't have to say intercourse, of course, but I say something about the erection, something like that, about the, se the sexual part, because I, I never read about it. Okay, that's a very interesting question, because actually, that has to do also with astronaut selection. Let's say that there is a flight to Mars. It's going to be three years by the time you return to Earth. So do you select, for example, all women? And I would ask the women, would you like to fly with only other women to be there for three years, all women together and in small spaces? Or all men? Or one woman? and the rest men, or one man and the rest women, or half men and half women, there is no decision made yet. 
because the gender issues, the psychological issues, obviously, if you have an astronaut who is married and has the spouse on the ground, you send that person to Mars for three years, what's likely to happen in space or on Mars? So should you send everybody who is single and no married astronauts? <laughs> so I can tell you right now, one of the main issues on selection for long duration space missions is psychological, and it has to do also with gender. The perception of safety, the perception of risk, uh, decisions about life and death are different between men and, and women. So I have my preference on uh, who should be, I would say that that's my opinion, it's not the opinion of the Federal Aviation Administration, but I would say that probably the commander should be a woman because women are very methodic, are very procedures based. They will make sure to maintain the discipline. <laughs> so there are many things that I think a, a woman commander would be very good for a very long term mission. Now, you talked about sex. I have had millionaires who want to fly in commercial space vehicles who have told me, I want to be the first woman and my husband or my companion having sex in space. I have had women saying, I, I want to be the first woman becoming pregnant in space. I have had women tell me, I want to be the first woman having a baby in space. Well, if it is a orbital flight, forget it. Three to four minutes of microgravity doesn't give you that much time to do anything. But at the same time, what's a risk? What do you do about it? And if you go with other participants and you have a very small vehicle, how are you going to do it? Now, there is a couple of astronauts that are husband and wife working at NASA. And for years, they have pushed if they can be allowed to fly together to see and do some research about the potential aspects of intercourse and other things. That has That is never going to happen. <laughs> not, not in government, uh, government operations. Is it possible that could happen in commercial space? I could say, if you want to do it and you have a lot of money, you and your wife are millionaires or billionaires, buy the entire flight for you and then you can do whatever you want. That would be my solution. Don't just buy a ticket, buy the entire flight <laughs> for you. <laughs> so that's possible, you see? Always you can find ways of doing it if you have enough money. <laughs> That's, that's really amazing to think so many possibilities and, and things that we, we do not know. And uh, we were having a conversation uh, a couple of weeks back about anxiety levels, you know, and, and sometimes people have uh, a pet or, or an assistance animal that they carry so they, they feel comfortable and they feel more relaxed. And, and the question arose is when people decide to go on these trips, can they take their pet? You know, even how big or how small it is going to be. Like on planes, you carry your, your dog or your cat. I, I would take a different approach. If the reason for you to take a pet is because you have, uh, let's say, a psychological condition that requires some kind of psychological support, you may not be a good candidate, at least initially, to go in a commercial space flight. Okay? Because you may end up experiencing panic. You may end up trying to do something that could be hazardous in flight. So I, at least initially, I don't see it happening. Eventually, it could be. But let's say if your problem is that you become too anxious. In fact, I told you about that other group that we met last week to identify research things for commercial space flight. The issue of anxiety and stress is on the top five. How are we going to avoid people from the general public to go in space and have panic in space? How? Well, first time is election, but then it's training. If, if as part of the training, the preparation for the space flight, you put them in an altitude chamber that is small space. You put them in a centrifuge that is even smaller space. You put them in a parabolic flight that is limited space. So things happen there because you're already testing how they are behaving in analog environments now you're more likely to find out if they will have problems in the real flight. So you sell it as training, but in fact, that becomes part of the medical evaluation and the psychological evaluation. 
and you call it training. Okay? It's being used. That's a very good idea to do that. Label it as something else. Not only that, but in order to be allowed to go into an altitude chamber or a human centrifuge, at least in the United States, you have to have at least a class two FAA medical certificate. So even though for spaceflight participants, we said only medical screening, the fact that the training may require to go in an altitude chamber or centrifuge, then you have to have the physical exam done anyway. <laughs> We have a question from Wagner Samaniego from Patagonia in Chile. So, he's asking, does the FAA has the plan for training the actual senior AME to certify the next special spatial tourist? Uh, we have a proposal, yes, in fact, uh, we developed a report actually doing that. We actually develop a prototype space medicine course, but then uh, because of uh, issues about potential liability, we stop that. However, what's happening with several of the commercial space companies, and in fact, space, uh, Virgin Galactic, they were the first ones to do it some years ago. In one of the meetings of the Aerospace Medical Association, they asked who were doctors designated by us, the FAA, to do physical exams of pilots. And they told them, if you're interested in potentially becoming uh, Dr. Q physical exams of our space flight participants, we will give you additional training in space medicine, and then you can perform the function for us. And they did it, okay? So, but we still have plan to develop, in fact, to update our curriculum for a space medicine course for whoever wants to take it. So, yes, we're still working on that. So that's really interesting to think, you know, on the on the type of team that you need on the ground to to get the people once yeah. the ones are coming down if they have any emergency if any accidents happen you know how the the the, the support staff has to be prepared to respond to that dr casanello what do you think are the main strengths of doctors in ecuador that can be very useful for this type of emergency responses well uh, all the emergency situations have the maybe the same components. You know, you can prepare with courses like the ACLS, the ATLS, that is going to the situation of cardiac arrest and also to trauma situations that prepare for the same problem that you are going to be to to fight in the, in the space on the maybe in the in these fight in the flights. You no. Know? So uh, that is really the, the same conditions for the emergency. It's not going to change. You know? we, are, uh, we have those course here, uh, courses here. We, we can go to, to teach them and practice and make the simulations that are very important in this topic. We, we can do it here. That is not a problem. Maybe we don't have the experience of trying to do it in the, in the space environment, you know, the, these suborbital sub flights, maybe we have to practice there, but we, we can do it here in Nepal. No problem with that. Perfect. Do no, I think we you... have another, another approach because let's say, Robert, that you convince the country to have a space port in, a, <laughs> in Ecuador. Then you have to think about what's the responsibility of the spaceport operator. If you have a commercial space launch operator, if they have an issue on the ground, even before launching or after coming back. So they would have to have agreements, for example, with uh, specialty hospitals at the launch site, what kind of medical personnel should you have there? And not necessarily just for your space flight uh, personnel. What about the maintenance personnel? What about the ground crews? What about the spectators that you could have hundreds or thousands of people going there? So that requires then a large, large group of medical care providers to be available for those operations and not necessarily just the space, but connected to the space operation. So that creates opportunities and markets for many other things, not just the flyers. <laughs> yeah, that's a great thought, Dr. Antoniano. Dr. Antonio, do you have any questions that you would like to make to Geronimo? Yes, yes, Geronimo. Um, what do you think? You see, you are, you are you're younger than me and you have also now students working for you. <laughs> so how do you see as the way to create an interest 
and create kind of a you want to, you want to call it the spirit for younger physicians to become involved in aerospace medicine something that could attract those people in ecuador to be in this area yes may, maybe we can make a, a kind of conference lecture that they can attend about the for example, the application of this basic science uh, like the physiology physiopathology in the space or related for commercial flight, flights even uh, also we can do in maybe for the the young doctors to do a kind of rotation mm -hmm. uh, interchange with you that is, is maybe going to be a good opportunity or some some trials that we can do together or something like that no? we can see the opportunity to to find what we can go to we can go to to investigate mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we can also work a lot with the universities here. I think that this is a good point, a good network with them, mm -hmm. that your institution can do it. Yes. Well, definitely, as you mentioned. In fact, we have all, all of the attendees here. Uh, the three of us had a conversation before that once we are under control with COVID-19, we could actually extend to all of your invitations to spend some time with us at the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute in Oklahoma to learn all of the things that we are doing and get you excited about what else you could do in your, in your own area. So we're going to explore that possibility with Jeronimo and Robert to see how we can implement those, those options. And with the University of Columbia School of Medicine in Bogota, maybe you can create a partnership between one of your universities and theirs, since they have the residency program in aerospace medicine there. Yes. That's, that's a good approach. That's, a good that, idea. that's great. Thank you so much for, for that open invitation, Dr. Antoniano. That, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, we're very for having people here having those type of opportunities, you know, and, and it's creating the awareness about how they can get involved and how these new careers can definitely have a positive impact on, in, in our society. So, so that's really, really important. Uh, now we are approaching the end of the program. It has been an amazing conversation with both Dr. Casanello and Dr. Antoniano, where they have shared their wisdom, their experience, the opportunities. And now we know that there's a, we have learned a lot, but there's so much still to learn. <laughs> We're just starting when you start thinking about what's the role of the, of, the, of the human body outside of this planet. And it's just incredible. So, so many things that can definitely happen. Uh, the Why I Kill Space Society is very happy to have host you both as our guest and we hope, hope that you can be coming again for one of our future webinars. You're all invited again. We're very glad that you decided to participate. Thank you. And uh, just so the rest of the audience know, uh, one of the initiatives that the Way Kill Space Society is gonna be pursuing this year is to encourage the Ecuadorian government to sign the Artemis Accords. The Artemis Accords are uh, a bilateral agreement between the United States government and other countries where they sign and talk about what is the role when you go to the moon? What is the role in space? How do, are you responsible? How are you sustainable? How do you communicate properly? And what do you, and the things that you have to do. And that is great because it definitely gives you a reason to do the right thing when you're in space and, and behave accordingly, you know, a set of proper protocols to establish per se. And, and there are a lot of lessons to learn from that one of them is international collaboration, being part of this great movement of the things that you can learn. The other one is about thinking sustainable, what lessons you can bring back to earth. And, and, and that's great about this conversation that we've had today is within this pursuit of going to space, we learn so much of the human body. What lessons now we can learn to fight diseases here, mm -hmm. get better quality of living, and, and definitely thinking about how overall Ecuadorians and the rest of people in Latin America can benefit from these discoveries. And, and with that, I just want to say thank you for all our participants tonight. And thank you for all the questions. And definitely wish you the best and hope to see you soon next month for our next event. Thank you again. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. 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 Thank you.